into policy relevant uh, recommendations for policy makers we know that uh, future contours of afghan polity is a rapprochement possible or not in afghanistan has come a long way and uh, we are now very close to uh, a deal and uh, as a consequence of continual efforts driven by a global power uh, a peace prospects are uh, very much on the horizon the peace process uh, would ensure and cater for a comprehensive dialogue including the nature and structure of the future government which is the most important aspect uh, to my mind the afghan constitution the future of security forces the nature of foreign assistance after the us forces leave and uh, the nature and uh, structure of uh, the whole relationship between society and the government is the most important aspect that needs to be clinched in a comprehensive intra afghan dialogue and it is for afghans to come up with a lasting and solid uh, foundation on which the future uh, peace process would be sustained concurrent to afghan peace process the role of afghanistan's neighbors is also very important in stabilizing the situation in the country however such an effort on a regional scale will face significant challenges if the united states withdraws its troops precipitously uh, before a proper comprehensive deal and agreement between the afghan government and taliban is signed the role of united nations also has to be taken into account because uh, after the withdrawal of american troops from afghanistan afghanistan would need definitely a sustained basis of uh, economic development and uh, sustaining the peace and security and governance related aspects so uh, a new uh, social contract that is in the making and when a new social contract is made there are a lot of variables and there is many a slip between cup and the lips which we hope that uh, due to the involvement of all regional stakeholders and all countries which have a stake in the peace uh, a very long lasting sustainable and comprehensive peace would be secured which is acceptable to all the stakeholders so without much ado i would like uh, the first speaker to be given the, the chance to enlighten us on this so over to wali thank you so much sir uh, our first speaker uh, dr hussain yasa i invite him to formally uh, present on his topic over to you dr yasa thank you very much walid and uh, first of all let me extend my uh, warmest regards to uh, janjua saab to prav durani to lodi saab old friend yasini saab and the people who are behind the scene so uh, the the topic is interesting and uh, uh, i have uh, come to this realization that the famous quote that dunya gol hai the earth is round about is uh, is really comes true in afghanistan uh, when after some time we reached to the same point from where we started long back so again the same uh, discussion from where we should start and how should we achieve the sustainable peace uh, and uh, stability in afghanistan how can we live with harmony with each other with all this this diversity which we have in our country so uh, anyway uh, we have reached to again again to a point that the whole world especially our neighbors uh, our own citizens they are very much uh, worried and they are uh, watching with a very uh, closed eyes and uh, really very uh, paying concentration to to all those talking about afghanistan who is talking what uh, what does the united states uh, want from afghanistan taliban and the other domestic and the regional stakeholders uh, uh, as far as my uh, personal 
opinion is concerned, uh, I think that uh, uh, the our constitution, our politician, the people who discussed Afghanistan and who took very important decisions throughout this uh, four decades and earlier than that, uh, I believe that there was uh, one ignorance in all those uh, uh, process that we never uh, uh, kept in mind that Afghanistan is a very, very deeply diverse society. And for the diverse societies, we have uh, to deal with the issue with a very, very uh, a new approach, not on the basis of the same approach. And what happens that after sometimes we again come to the same point from where we started. So I believe that everything is possible in Afghanistan. We are also the human being. <clears throat> We are, uh, we are also, uh, we know the values, but the problem is that how, how we should live uh, uh, under which type of system this, uh, uh, we, we, we never had basically a procedural approach. Uh, we stuck to the moral values. And uh, when you talk to many Afghan friends, uh, civil society members, politicians, they will give you a very long lecture about the moral aspect and the cultural aspect of, of the democracy, but unfortunately, we never had a very good procedural approach. Uh, so that's why I believe that one of the main obstacles in our way that we are not able to, uh, to live uh, in harmony is uh, uh, the lack of that procedural approach. So I believe that Afghan constitution, the future constitution, certainly the many people so it's a complicated issue but many people they they need amendments in the constitution or probably some of those who will come uh, uh, at the uh, table in their future probably they want a completely a new constitution so we need to pay attention very uh, as a as, as a, it's it's very vital basically that if we will stuck to the same idea of centralized presidential and unitary system, I think uh, we will not move forward. Because I don't believe that the problem of uh, Afghanistan is Taliban. Taliban is created very nearly. It is not very old issue, 1994 onward. So earlier than that, we had problem. Uh, we had a civil war. Earlier than that, in the jihad period, even when the various communities took the weapons, they used to fight with each other time to time. So that's why uh, I believe that we need, we need a new approach. Afghanistan cannot go ahead with this uh, presidential unitary system. There should be some new substantial approach to address this diversity. Otherwise, it will keep raising its head uh, sometime under one problem and sometime under the other problem. So that's why uh, we have everything, we are analyzing every aspect of our, uh, our uh, uh, problems. Uh, but the thing which lacks here, and we never discuss it, it that uh, a new institutional approach, new political system, and uh, 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 keeping in view this new emerging situation, I believe that uh, it will be very, very difficult to to keep uh, uh, all those very uh, uh, different ideas uh, with a very huge distance, we cannot keep all of them under a single roof. Uh, we need a, a little bit different approach and we have to kill all those false legacies, incorrect narratives. We are a diverse nation and uh, we, uh, we have different cultures, different backgrounds. So we need to live in harmony but which is not possible uh, under this uh, presidential unitary system. So that's why, once again, probably uh, uh, I, we, we will have discussion and we will further elaborate in the, uh, on this issue. Uh, my, uh, in brief, my point is that everything is possible in Afghanistan, but not under this uh, enacted political system, the presidential unitary system, and one more point which I, which I should uh, add in that, that the other issue uh, when Afghanistan was uh, new Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban, unfortunately, we stuck to the very old ideas like as far as the 
uh, our electoral system, we brought uh, an electoral system which was completely abandoned by the rest of the world, which was single non-transferable vote system. It was also designed. I don't know why the people uh, uh, have uh, so huge fear and they are always, always, uh, they have been the hostages of their fears, unfortunately. And on the other hand, we never had uh, a, a fairly conducted uh, population census. We don't have any record, any data. We don't have uh, always it was dealt politically. So I think we, we need a new approach, basically. So this is my, the, 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 the core of, of my uh, you see, opinion in this, uh, in this uh, esteemed uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, our second speaker, the Honorable Mr. Mirwai Yasini, I would request you to, sir, please uh, uh, address us on your topic. Does the existing Afghan constitution cater Afghanistan's political needs? Over to you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for providing me this opportunity to be part of this uh, very, very important webinar. And welcome uh, to all the participants uh, Mr. Janjua Saab, uh, my very good friend, uh, Dr. Yasa, Ambassador Durani Saab, Ambassador Abrar Saab, uh, Luzi Saab, and uh, all the participants who are behind the scene uh, or who are, who are uh, within the scene. Uh, first of all, I have to say that I was a uh, first deputy speaker for the Constitution, Louis Jirga, and uh, those Louis Jirgas both emergency Louis Jirga and subsequently constitution Louis Jirga uh, went to a great deal of uh, deliberations uh, to come up with this constitution. I have to say, uh, we inherited almost no system uh, from the previous uh, regime or from the previous era. So everything we started from the stretch, uh, number one. Number two, uh, we had some foreign experts with us that uh, they gave us some outline of the constitution and uh, there were 40 members uh, shura or commission that who presented uh, the constitution the draft of the constitution to the Louis Jirga. we had uh, up and down <clears throat> particularly on some issues like the women kuta uh, i remember uh, and i have to be very realistic and historically i would like to be precise uh, that uh, women bodies inside the Louis Jirga and outside, they wanted to have 50% of the quotas uh, in constitution for the parliament and uh, as well as for the Senate. After long uh, discussions, uh, we came up with the uh, result that no 25% was agreed, so 25% quota. Well, if we see the realities of the pluralism in democracy, in particularly in the third world or even in very pro progressive worlds, uh, what is the percentage of literacy for the women in Afghanistan? Giving them the 25% uh, quota as was very, very uh, more than required because uh, at that time, not even 5% of the women was literate and uh, not only 5% or below the level of 5 percentage was involved in the um, electoral process and uh, being a member or representative of the masses within the Senate as well as the lower house in the provincial councils in the, uh, in the whole uh, political arena. So that does, uh, of course, is a problem there. As my very uh, dear friend Dr. Yasa said, the system do we have to adopt still the um, presidential or very centralized system or we have to switch it to the parliamentary system? That's also questionable. That, had, that does need a lot of discussion. Uh, are we uh, able, uh, if we do talk about the current and about the previous, immediate previous uh, system as the society is willing to observe the decentralized system, as he very well uh, discussed it in the voting system, non-transferable vote, which is already here, can be switched there <clears throat> to other system. 
or maybe combined system, this is one. But to me, the more important thing is, if we go to all the, to the holy books, in different interpretation of the holy books, uh, which is given by Almighty Allah, but the, 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 the question is of the, the implementation, number one. And prior to that, the question is of the interpretation. How to interpret the things? I do precisely remember that uh, our constitution is uh, saying that the presidential tenure, uh, the new president has to take the oath on the Jawza, which is the fifth year in the second, uh, the third month of the year. It does mean that it's four years, but uh, with all respect, uh, that time the Supreme Court Chief Justice of the full bench of the Supreme Court interpreted it that has to complete five years. So there is no sira, uh, sira by the mean that is, there is no any reasons or any dalil to take it out from the, con uh, out of uh, context to take it to six years. Uh, five year complete and then on the sixth year, the third month. So what I'm trying to say, whatever we inherited, what we are we going to, uh, to adopt, the more important thing will be how we are implementing that, how we are practicing that. Uh, is the law or the constitution is the same for the, uh, for the people who are in the power, for the people who are on the street, for the ordinary man. Uh, those things, the most important thing is uh, um, uh, the, 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 the implementation of the constitution. If I come to the read the current constitution, of course, we do need to amend the constitution. Is all the constitutions have, like the American constitution, the amendments are more than the, the, the actual body. So, so we have to, to if we have to, to, to do a lot of amendment. In order to start it from the scratch, I don't see there any need for it. That will be time consuming, that will be resources consuming, that will be the, 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 the talent comes, consuming, from where we do get uh, the new body for the constitution. So that will be better if we amend the current constitution, even though if uh, those amendments are very profound, if the uh, amendments are, 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 are very vital, uh, we have to amend the current constitution as, uh, as far as I have heard, as far as I know from the Taliban, uh, they would like to, uh, to, to change the constitution, but I will strongly recommend the amendment of the constitution, of course. Other thing is that the right of the citizens. And uh, we, for the past 20 years, uh, there was no practical room or there was no practice, really the right of the, 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 uh, the citizens, uh, right of freedom, that everybody does take it its own analogy and everybody does take it its own interpretation of the, of the, the uh, constitution. Well, is the Supreme Court is the body to interpret the constitution or is the commission of the um, interpretation of the constitution is a valid uh, source to, 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 uh, to, to interpret the constitution. Those things have to be ascertained ahead of time. I don't mind if you go and switch from the uh, presidential system to the parliamentary system, but very importantly, we have to have the mature the political maturity in Afghanistan. Uh, do we have the still in our current, which I remember of it, uh, the current uh, lower house in the upper house, are those are mature uh, bodies? I'm talking, are they, in, they, they are loyal to their, uh, first of all, they can define their national interest by individual or by at large. Uh, can they uh, implement uh, their, version of the, 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 the national interest, is there any room for that? So my point is, in short, uh, we have to stick with the current one constitution, but with the, with the very important and significant, significant amendments uh, that, will be, that will not take a lot of time. Uh, and as far as our Taliban are concerned that uh, we have to change the constitution. Section number one is very, very clear that nothing coming in this constitution has to be repugnant or differ to the Islamic values. I think that section is enough and that just take embody the whole constitutional uh, essence that things has to be 
according to Islam, nothing is repugnant or against the Islamic laws in values. That's very important. But uh, again, I would say I'll recommend the current constitution with deep and vital and fundamental amendment in changes in the system. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now we move on to our next speaker, Ambassador Sayyid Abrar Hussain, who will be speaking on can UN contribute towards Afghanistan's reconstruction in the post-US withdrawal from Afghanistan? Sir, over to you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Brigadier Rashid Bali Janjua, Acting President Ipri. Uh, thanks to you and your team for organizing, providing me with an opportunity to say a few words in Sigal. I'm happy to see many friends and Afghan experts around. Let me convey my regards to all of them especially my friends from Afghanistan, Brother Mirwais Yasini and Dr. Hussain Ali Yasa. Well, in next few minutes, I'll try to look uh, into this question. Can UN contribute towards Afghanistan's reconstruction in the post-US withdrawal from Afghanistan? Uh, well, before coming directly uh, to the answer, uh, let me briefly touch upon the background. The UN and Afghanistan have a long-standing partnership. Afghanistan became a UN member in 1946, and different UN bodies, different UN agencies have been working in Afghanistan for about 60 to 70 years now. UNICEF, for example, began its operations there in 1949. Uh, World Food Program is there uh, since 1963. Uh, similarly, UNDP is working there since 1966. But then lately, in 2002, the UN Security Council established UNAMA, the UN Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, to support the government and people of Afghanistan. UNAMA works with other UN agencies to achieve greater coherence. And currently, there are more than 20 agencies, funds, and programs that are working in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, the UN has organized a series of donors' conference on reconstruction and development of Afghanistan. Most important of them was Tokyo Conference in 2012 where $16 billion were pledged by international community for transformation decade, which means 2015 to 2024. And also established a mutual accountability framework. This conference was then followed by EU's Brussels conference, London conference, and so on. In Brussels conference in 2016, $15 billion were pledged. And then in 2018, there was Geneva Conference, which was a non-pledging conference, of course. The next pledging conference is expected in November this year in Geneva again. Well, all this background gives us an idea of how the UN can contribute towards reconstruction in the post-US withdrawal in Afghanistan. Reconstructing Afghanistan is, however, a monumental task and it will require broad international support and significant material and human resources. UN is perhaps the only platform that can be used by international community for this purpose. UN is acceptable to all parties in Afghanistan, by and large, as compared to any other forum. The UN also has a vast network with a number of field offices in Afghanistan. As I said earlier, there are more than 20 UN agencies already working in Afghanistan. Moreover, the UN sponsorship of the Bonn Agreement demonstrates its legitimacy and authority as a neutral forum. The Afghan reconstruction 
primarily requires restoration of all national institutions that provide law and order. And administer political affairs and deliver basic economic and social services. These have all been weakened by the decades of war. The UN can play a leadership role in three particular areas. Number one, managing support for the political process and help building political institutions. Number two, overseeing donor coordination efforts. And number three, managing humanitarian assistance programs. But how successful the UN, how successful can UN be? Or how successfully it can play its role in the cigar depends on certain factors. First of all, the commitment of international community to a fund reconstruction as Afghanistan will require significant assistance from a range of countries and global institutions. In this regard, there is a need for a comprehensive joint assessment of Afghanistan's needs, as was done in the case of Guatemala and East Timor. Thirdly, how far the UN is able to demonstrate its neutral stance vis-a-vis -vis all major groups in Afghanistan. Having said all this, let me confess that Ambassador Ibrar, I would request if you could kindly unmute yourself. I think you've accidentally muted yourself. Uh, well, I don't know uh, from where I uh, to continue. So you're perfectly again. audible now. You're perfectly audible. So please continue. Okay. Uh, I was, I was uh, talking about the uh, three factors on which depends the success of UN in reconstruction of Afghanistan. The first of them was the commitment of the global community. Well, uh, uh, as we all know that last time, uh, when Afghanistan was left to its own, there was a disaster. So if the global community realizes that it's important not to leave Afghanistan alone this time, and they are committed to Afghan reconstruction, then of course uh, uh, they should know that it requires significant assistance that significant assistance from a range of countries and global institutions. And in this regard, there is a need uh, to assure a comprehensive joint assessment of Afghanistan's needs, as was done in the case of many other countries, such as East Timor and Guatemala. And thirdly, uh, secondly, it's important that there is support from Afghan government, especially through its efficient and credible performance to satisfy the donors through mutual accountability mechanisms. Previously, this was one of the main hurdles, main problems, that the donor countries were not satisfied with the good governance, with the performance of the Afghan government and with the performance of the institutions who were utilizing the funds given by the donor countries. So this is also very important. And thirdly, how far the UN is able to demonstrate its net neutral stance vis-a-vis -vis all major groups in Afghanistan. That UN is not seen as a party, not seen as a supporter of one group against the other. So these are all very important factors in the success of UN while reconstructing Afghanistan. Well, having said all this, let me confess that there is no shortcut to the reconstruction of Afghanistan, and it requires a long term and consistent efforts to reconstruct Afghanistan. Well, uh, reconstruction 
will have all these aspects political economic and social and of course from security angle you can also talk of the afghan army afghan law enforcing agencies and so on and we can go into uh, so many details but primarily the question was whether un will be able to uh, play some role in the reconstruction of afghanistan and my answer is yes if all these criteria are met and if all uh, 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 these factors which i enumerated uh, are taken into account thank you so much thank you so much sir um, now i would like to invite uh, miss amara durani who is a senior research fellow at the jinnah institute uh, she will be speaking on international efforts for the repatriation of afghan refugees ma'am the floor is yours thank you uh, first of all uh, my thanks to uh, president ifri brigadier janjua and his able team uh, for having me uh, in this well timed webinar and my greetings to all the esteemed uh, speakers from uh, afghanistan and pakistan it's yeah. my privilege to be part of this important conversation uh i think uh, as with other aspects that my colleagues have covered uh during the course of this webinar so far the question of afghan refugees and the international communities uh treatment of this question and management of this question also depends on first and foremost the past politics and the current geopolitics revolving around the afghan conflict if we look at the history of the afghan refugee question i think it's very important to first and foremost identify the trends that the overall refugees uh, question has how it has evolved over decades what have been the patterns on the overall refugees uh, um, phenomenon in the world you know the, the world's attention on the question of afghan refugees was perhaps first captured with that iconic uh, national geographic magazine photo of sherbat gulla in 1984 and that was the start of the afghan war and for for all for the cold war paraphernalia that was imposed on afghanistan that prism somehow that stuck on the afghan refugees question also the world you didn't stop because of me uh, but see in any case the 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 world for more than 30 years of the afghan conflict which has gone through a number of cycles first with the soviet invasion and then the civil war and then the us invasion in 2001 the toppling of the taliban regime all these cycles have also periodically affected the ebb and flow of the afghan refugees across its neighbors as well as all over the world so the interconnection between the ev evolution of afghan conflict how the world perceives and treats the afghan conflict and how the refugees have fared over the last 40 years is very important it was not until frankly speaking um, the eruption of the syrian conflict in the early 2000s that the world really woke up to the global phenomenon of of refugee crisis look at the global figures right now we've got 26 million refugees all over the world emanating from a proliferation of conflicts that have evolved in the last uh, uh, two decades or so afghanistan conflict is no longer the only major conflict of the world and that is very important to understand why the afghan refugee problem has not been managed or tackled as efficiently and sustainably as it should have been because it has been viewed from a cold war paradigm it has been viewed from a parochial regional paradigm as a headache for for afghanistan's neighbors primarily the headache absorbed by pakistan you know i'm using headache in quotations absorbed by its uh, neighbors like pakistan and iran and you know the international community has been maintaining a safe distance to a certain extent it's not until the syrian uh, crisis and a great inflow of illegal migrants uh, who have started touching uh, the shores of europe when when bodies of young children uh, started washing up on the shores of europe 
that the international community had really woke up to the question of refugees as a whole. And we now have a debate whereby there is a lot of sense of increased uh, uh, anger and a sense of uh, absence of responsibility or accountability for Western governments by their publics that the rich countries have not done enough to bear the responsibilities of refugees of the world, and that includes the Afghan refugees. So I think this global uh, paradigm shift, first and foremost, needs to be understood how conflict has, has evolved and how that has impacted uh, the political question of Afghan refugees. And unfortunately, this has been an extremely politicized issue not least just because of the uh, unfortunately negative bilateral relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan, but also the overall uh, politicization of uh, the refugees question, uh, including the Afghan refugees. Moving on, I think uh, Ambassador Abrar has raised a crucial question about the international community's commitment to Afghanistan following exit of the US and NATO forces. I think that also cuts across uh, for the question of Afghan refugees. Is Pakistan and Iran and Afghanistan's neighbors, are they going to go back to the same route of shouldering the heavy burden that they've been carrying for you know, 40 odd years uh, and making do with even less resources and bigger populations of their own than they did in the past? If that scenario is going to re-emerge, then, then we are not going, we would not be able to tackle the Afghan refugee uh, 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 question in a, in a just manner, in a humane manner, in, in according to principles of the UN Agenda 2030 that have been identified in the recently formed a global compact uh, on refugees. Uh, you know, the global compact uh, conference, the first conference was held in Geneva in December. Uh, it was co-convened by Pakistan and the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan also spoke at that um, historic summit. That's the first uh, post-Cold War international effort to redefine um, thought paradigm on the question of refugees, whether they're Afghans and, and other. And I think it's a more holistic, more humane, um, more values-based. And as um, uh, Dr. Yasa pointed out for the need of adopting a procedural structural method for addressing Afghanistan's structural issues and refugees is a structural issues. It's not just a political question, it's more so a structural question. It is absolutely imperative that the neighbors of Afghanistan are assisted with those structural capabilities, with those structural resources uh, to be able to efficiently manage the transition as we move along the peace process. And I think the intra-Afghan dialogue uh, that we hope will kickstart in Doha very soon, I think this is one of the key questions because as Afghans sit down to decide the future and fate of their country, they will also need to see how they're going to balance uh, the return of the refugees, the economic balance, the social and, and cultural and political balance that they will need to uh, factor in, not to forget that given the high demographic cohort of young people, of children, of women, these are three major demographic groups that constitute a big majority of the refugees. How are these uh, uh, youngsters, these children, these women, they're going to be provided health, uh, safety, protection, education, skills, socioeconomic uh, uh, integration, um, uh, shelter. These are big questions. Uh, and there would be a, a conflict of a competition for resources, which are already very scant. So I think these are big structural uh, issues that the international community will need to uh, factor. Uh, I believe Ambassador Abrar mentioned the role of UNAMA. I see that Yonama in, in recent months has been at the forefront of engaging key Afghanistan stakeholders on uh, uh, questions of post-conflict governance, on questions of um, economic reconstruction, political reconstruction. And I'm assuming that the question of refugees is a big uh, issue that is on the table. Um, but I think unless that international 
sustainable long term commitment not to abandon afghanistan this time not to follow the trend of conflict as has been the the practice in past um, of 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 the western world unfortunately uh, not to abandon old conflicts in search for new ones as long as that commitment is there as long as uh, the resource line is there i think afghanistan's neighbors would also step up and bringing bring in a new set of of values and approaches to to tackle this question um, collectively i'll stop at this point and i look forward to being part of the discussion thank you so much ma'am um, we now have our final speaker of the day uh, mr imtiaz gul and he will be speaking on role of neighbors in the stability of afghanistan uh, with that sir over to you okay uh, thank you very much uh, first of all uh, thank you for inviting me second uh, secondly i really want to apologize for joining you late i was on a similar consultation webinar with london um to so the past two hours uh, we have been busy with that and uh, i i'm sincere, i sincerely apologize for <clears throat> having defaulted on my promise uh, but now finally i hopefully you know you will pardon me for that and uh, i can basically convey a few thoughts whatever i have jotted down in terms of uh, the neighbors role in afghanistan it seems like afghanistan you know is part of has become part of our lives and will remain part of our lives the discourse on afghanistan um we have been hearing for many afghans themselves in the in the recent weeks that uh, um they have reached an end game pointing to the impending doha talks but they are unclear uh, i think that how difficult it's going to be and how long it's going to last we still don't know i think the kabul delegation uh, hasn't reached doha yet as as far as i know until early this morning uh, be, and the the outcome of the talks or even the kick starting will depend on many variables how the taliban and the kabul stakeholders will conduct themselves in the coming days and weeks so on the role of uh, the neighboring countries i have a, i can offer a few points that uh, generally the neighboring most of the neighboring countries uh, believe that a peaceful afghanistan will benefit the region and that they don't want the country to revert to the hub of terrorism again um then the main driver i think behind this regional consensus is the economic uh, connectivity a stable afghanistan uh, can enhance economic prosperity better connectivity and increased trade and energy cooperation there is no rocket science uh, involved to understand this however the iran's tensions with the with the us they continue to be a, a troubling uh, hot spot tehran has been quiet but uh, we also have to recognize that um, um, it has it formally recognizes kabul government while uh, also maintains a uh, close links to taliban as much as uh, china pakistan and russia do because they consider taliban as the bulwark against uh, proxy terrorism i would assume uh, then another variable is uh, the us india relations uh, it's uh, in the words of alice wells it's a rare instance of bipartisanship in uh, in america and however the if the trump administration or the whoever comes after him they continue to look at uh, uh, at afghanistan through the indian prism that will be a complicating factor now us china tensions right now in the play and us iran ties deteriorating as we have seen in the recent uh, weeks they require i think some new, neutral platform like un or uh, something like un where they can all sit together and sort out their differences instead instead of uh, fanning hatreds and uh, conflicting uh, narratives now as for pakistan i think us officials as well as uh, several un uh, dignitaries have repeatedly acknowledged that uh, pakistan and central asian neighbors of afghanistan and uh, uh, i think significant uh, most uh, primarily tajikistan uzbekistan 
they have so far played a very positive and constructive role in the US, in the peace process. We also have to take into account uh, what uh, our Prime Minister told uh, the Al Jazeera TV, I think four or five days ago. And that's a very instructive uh, statement as far as Pakistan's position is concerned. Uh, the Prime Minister said, whatever the Afghans think is good for them is good for us. Whatever influence we could use, I honestly think we have tried our best to somehow get the Taliban and Afghan government sit on one table. This is a miracle that it is actually happening. We pray that this happens. We realize that there are spoilers. There is certainly one country, India, which does not want it happen. And uh, he said it four or five days ago, but then there was a tweet last night by our beloved Afghan Vice President Amrullah Saleh. Um, I think in reference to the, to the border uh, and the border fencing by Pakistan, he says in his, tweet, in his tweet, no Afghan politician of national stature can overlook the issue of Durand line. It will condemn him or her in life and after life. It is an issue which needs discussions and resolution. Expecting us to gift it for free is unrealistic. Peshawar used to be the winter capital of Afghanistan. Now, this is quite uh, strange, but uh, we didn't have to respond to that. The former Assistant Secretary of State, uh, Alice Wells, responded to him through a tweet about uh, 10 hours ago. And she says, Afghan politicians of national stature know that the Durand line is an internationally recognized border. Fanning nationalist or irredentist claims detracts from negotiating peace and economically beneficial ties between the two countries. So this is the biggest uh, risk that is coming to this regional neighborly consensus uh, on Afghanistan. So I would say to conclude a couple of points that neighbors must not exploit internal polarizations and inequities. Neighbors must not exploit bilateral fault lines. The fault line that Amrullah Saleh pointed to, it's not a fault line, but they still treat it as a fault line, which uh, other countries do exploit. So the neighbors basically should be discouraged to support statements such as those by Amrullah Saleh. India will have to scale down its overbearing political involvement with stakeholders within the Ashraf Ghani administration, such as uh, Amrullah Saleh and many within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the security establishment. And lastly, I think the US administration, whoever comes to power, shall have to nudge Afghanistan's neighbors not to fish in troubled waters for their own narrowly defined national interests. And they shall have to basically nudge all the neighbors of Afghanistan to stay on the same page as far as uh, pushing the peace process and nudging the stakeholders to talks, to fruitless talks is concerned. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is also my pleasure to say that we have three distinguished discussants with us as well. Um, I would now request our first discussant, Lieutenant General Naim Khalid Lodi, for his questions and comments on the discussion that we have had so far. Sir, please. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I think it's a great pleasure to uh, be with our Afghan brothers and also very eminent panelists, uh, Pakistani panelists. And I think such interactions should be more frequent uh, and more diverse. Uh, I was a little surprised that why why were we uh, why did we ask them to discuss with us the Afghan constitution because that is their internal matter uh, they should decide what sort of constitution they want and uh, what what suits them anyway uh, good that they have shared their uh, thoughts with us otherwise they would have refused they could have said why are you asking us to discuss with you the Afghan constitution anyway one thing which I noticed is and I do not know whether we can overcome that or not. And that is uh, one of the main stakeholders missing, the Afghan Taliban. All right. if, we, if we really want to have a fruitful discussion that what is the likely uh, future of Afghanistan and how uh, the things should settle down, I think we must uh, try to have more stakeholders, uh, not only Afghan Taliban, if there are others also, I think we must do that. We, I think what I've heard is that there seems to be a consensus that whatever happens in Afghanistan is dependent on the internal politics, and the international politics. Uh, you know, it is, it is the size of the country, it is the vulnerability of the country, it is the history of the country, 
on which it depends that how much the external politics or international politics will affect them. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Afghanistan is, has remained such a hot spot uh, that uh, for quite some time, I feel that uh, the external uh, for polar, uh, international politics will have some uh, very profound impact on whatever happens within Afghanistan. We keep on saying, and it is a, I mean, uh, uh, theoretically, it is good to say that we must uh, uh, leave the Afghans to their own, uh, and they, every solution should be Afghan led and Afghan owned. But so far, we have seen that uh, whatever is happening is not totally Afghan owned and not totally Afghan led. It is being uh, assisted or it is being guided, or it is, uh, you know, some friends are there and they are doing all that. I would like to uh, highlight one point, the basic thing uh, that uh, we should all review that what are the interests of the main international players in Afghanistan? And I think Imtiaz Gul Sahib have, uh, has uh, very uh, rightly brought out uh, that what would the Americans like? What sort of Afghanistan the Americans would like? Would they like to have Chinese influence or Russian influence or Iranian influence or even Pakistan's influence and to what extent? And whether they are in a position to retain their own influence if not physically, uh, through proxies, through Pakistan, through India, or through uh, money, or through dollars, or whatever. They have their ways and means, and we, we, we know that. Uh, so uh, this has to be seen that how much uh, these big powers, uh, they, they, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they push forward their agendas in Afghanistan, unfortunately. Uh, we, I, can, I, can, I can understand and we all understand that the main stakeholders are the Afghan people and they want peace. They must be fed up. I mean, even, even the neighbors, uh, we, we feel that pain that if we, once we see that such a uh, you know, big tragedy happening for such a long time in the neighborhood and how would those women, children and men living uh, in, in that area. So Chinese have an interest which is related to CPAC which is related to Central Asian country. Russians have an interest which is related to uh, warm water, we know, and uh, it is through Iran and Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan. And CPEC cannot fully flower as long as there's, uh, you know, this Afghan problem is not resolved and we do not have peace in Afghanistan. We know that uh, Americans would not like this to happen, uh, whatever I've said about CPEC and about Russia and about China. Americans would like to have, would still like to see what is happening in Iran and what is happening in, in the nuclear Pakistan and all that. So it is, a, it is a difficult situation. I'll leave it at that. I'll just ask a question from my Afghan brothers. Uh, we, we know that uh, there was an agreement between uh, uh, Afghan Taliban and uh, America, uh, United States in Doha. And uh, most of their, you know, articles are known to us. There might be certain, uh, you know, things, clauses, which are not known to us. But we, we also think that uh, the, the, the day this uh, thing was being signed in Doha, uh, the Secretary of Defense, American Secretary of Defense was in, uh, uh, you know, one capital, Kabul, and he was talking to the Afghan government. And it, 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 I assume that there must have been some agreement between Afghan government and U.S., uh, if my uh, Afghan brothers can tell me if they are aware of any such agreement uh, between the Afghan government and uh, United States of America. And if some clauses are known to them, they can uh, uh, share, uh, share with us. And also the second question I would uh, just uh, leave for them is that uh, uh, what do they feel uh, about CPAC, uh, whether they want to become a part of it, uh, uh, would they like to uh, get benefited from that? And if that is the case, how would they balance out uh, the Indian and the American interest, those who don't want CPAC in this area? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I would uh, request the uh, speakers, uh, Mr. Yassini and Dr. Yasa, if they could answer the question that uh, General Lodi has posed. May I? Yes, sir, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it was really uh, learning and uh, thought provoking discussion without any doubt. And uh, honorable uh, mem panel members, panelists, they have covered almost all areas. 
uh, it is very difficult to, to comment on all the issues. Just uh, sticking to the last question, I would rather go to this uh, issue of CPEC. Uh, as far as CPEC is concerned now, CPEC, uh, we cannot just uh, analyze this big issue, this mega project, some says game changer, just with the context of Pakistan or Afghanistan. This is, as you know, that this is the southern part of the Belt and Road Initiative, a very, very big project. And uh, for Afghanistan, this is very crucial to be the part of this uh, big project because except for Afghanistan, all the remaining countries, they have signed uh, this uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And I don't know why Afghanistan is uh, too much reluctant. Probably, uh, I'm, I'm not that type of person. I can't speak very, uh, uh, you see, uh, very clearly on this uh, uh, sensitive issues. But anyway, there are multiple factors as our friends mentioned. But this is uh, for the uh, future benefit of Afghanistan, for its people, because it is Afghanistan should not look at this project just politically, but it has a very, very big uh, economical project and it is integrating the whole region. So uh, we, ha we have been sp speaking about a lot of other issues, common language, common religion, and uh, a lot of uh, cultural similarities we have, but we should focus also on the geo economy of this big uh, deal which is going on around us. And this is in the favor of Afghanistan and many, many leaders with whom I have been talking and interacting, they are in favor of uh, joining CPEC. This is not the matter of why we should, why we should relate everything, connect everything with the Devran line, the dead issue. No one, no one is going to pursue. It doesn't, uh, it, it is no more a valid issue. If this is a valid issue, I suggest that Amrullah Saleh or our pres president or government should go to any international court and claim it. They, when they had the, the two, like president of Afghanistan, prime minister of uh, Pakistan, if they have good relations, there is no Devran line. If uh, they don't have good relations, yeah, then always there is a Devran line. I appreciate Pakistani government. Well done. They have, they have done very good. They have sealed their border. And uh, there, there is no more a uh, valid issue. Why we should sacrifice every issue? The well-being of our people, the prosperity of our people, the stability of our country. Why should we sacrifice all this uh, just for the issue which was dead all, already, it, it was the political issue of 60s. We have to, we have to abandon this old habit to, to, to see everything with the old glasses. This is 21st century. And we have to adopt ourselves with the new values, with the new corporations of the region. I think this is my approach. As for as CPEC, most of the people of Afghanistan, most of the politicians in Afghanistan, policy makers, they are in favor of this project. Can I intervene here? Absolutely, sir. Please, please go ahead. Well, uh, Excellency General uh, Naeem Luzi saw, uh, put very important questions uh, in front of us. Number one, 29 February, uh, the card uh, signing in Doha and uh, the, foreign, the US Foreign Secretary uh, Pompeo was present there, and then as per the Defense Secretary in Kabul, what does that mean? First of all, uh, we don't have much information of that. But as far as we can imagine and as we can perceive, that was very uh, much diplomatic move. Uh, deal is signing in Doha. Uh, Taliban is there, uh, does mean the official recognition to them. And uh, they didn't want to make unhappy the Afghan partner in Kabul, sending another dignitaries here, uh, Mark Esper here, just to keep the balance for the time being, uh, and not to 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 imbalance the relation uh, of the United States between the Taliban and uh, and in the Afghan government here. 
I think that was a, a very much short term diplomatic move. Nothing be, uh, we can, we, we can uh, imagine beyond that. That's number one. Number two, the CPAC. Well, Afghanistan has a fee of claiming our independence and our integrity. We do not have to look toward the pennies and dollars of the other for ages. We have to generate our own income. We have to think about our own national interest. We have to think about our own hunger. We have to think about our own bad and good days. So we need our own economics independence. This is not only independence by the name. CPEC is giving us uh, the opportunity of uh, economics uh, activities, connectivities, jobs, uh, 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 opportunities to our citizens. And uh, who cares if it is uh, um, not in accord with uh, the Indian or with the American or anybody. Uh, so we have to follow our own national interest. And uh, my view, we do have to stick with all the projects which get, get, get giving us the food, which giving us the work, which giving us the, 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 the hard currency as well as the, the soft, whatever you, you, you name it. So I will stick to the Afghan national interest and the Afghan national interest does require that we have to, to have our own economy rather than to depend on the other economies and look for the, we cannot remain bigger forever, ever, ever. So we have to be independent in our own home. Thank you very much. That was my, my, my answer to, to Mr. Dodi. Thank you very much, uh, our honorable participants. Um, now I would request our second discussant, um, Ambassador Asif Durrani, and he is our final discussant, for his questions and comments regarding the discussion. Sir, please. Uh, thank you very much, dear. Um, uh, first of all, let me uh, welcome, formally welcome my dear friends, uh, uh, Janab uh, Mirwais Yasini and Dr. Yasa, who have very kindly joined uh, in this very important uh, discussion uh, on Afghanistan peace process and its prospects and challenges. Uh, and definitely, uh, and their uh, valuable comments and their participation has enlightened us uh, a lot uh, to to learn about the the existing trends which are going on, especially after the signing of the accord between uh, the U.S. and the Taliban. However, uh, this may be a big uh, step we may consider, but at the same time, there are many challenges uh, which uh, we face. Uh, from the Pakistani perspective, and since Pakistan uh, has suffered a lot as well uh, because of the happenings in Afghanistan, and uh, because of the commonality, um, the kind of uh, commonality between Afghanistan and Pakistan need not to be reiterated. Now, the kind of access which Pakistan and Afghanistan have both uh, among uh, within uh, with each other is rare. Uh, so that uh, creates a symbiotic relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, irrespective of the fact that uh, some of uh, um, uh, sometimes we uh, hear uh, uh, sometimes uh, unkind remarks uh, from either side. But uh, at the end of the day, we are brothers. We have shared joys and sorrows, maybe less joys, more sorrows, but at the same time, we have stood by each other. Uh, irrespective of the fact that uh, when uh, um, Pakistan had uh, wars with uh, India in 65 and 71, and uh, those uh, who have seen the archives, so they would bear me out that uh, uh, former King Zahir Shah, uh, may God bless his soul, he in fact uh, asked our ambassador that why are you keeping your troops along our borders? I'm not going to... So this is something which is a record. Uh, so, and Pakistan cannot forget that. We normally do talk about that Afghanistan was the first country to oppose Pakistan's admission 
uh, in the UN system, but at the same time, subsequent events, there may be certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, unpleasant events, but uh, when it Uh, then I think Pakistan stood by uh, their Afghan brothers. So uh, this is uh, something we have to keep in mind while we discuss the differences among the two brotherly nations. Now coming to the actual issue now that, uh, that the accord have been signed and after much wrangling, the prisoner exchange by and large has taken place. There may be some Irritants left. The issue is that how to bring about peace in the country, and that is for Pakistan is important that it is our Afghan friends. Now the, the whole game is being played by the Afghan stakeholders by themselves. We are outside the tent. We when we say that we all all the neighbors are Afghanistan are outside the tent. We cannot interfere. We should not interfere and. That is the best policy. But at the same time, we should be aware of the fact that neighbors, when if there is problem, trouble in your next neighbor, uh, so everyone gets worried. So we would not be an exception if we are not worried or concerned. Because as I said, there's a symbiotic relationship between us. So in that case, Mirwais uh, Yasin Saab has very ably uh, elaborated about the constitutional process and how it came about and he himself has been the part of that constitutional process. We are much enlightened. Dr. Yasa has raised very uh, important issues with regard to the existing presidential system or in the past the, this kind of system which has not catered uh, to uh, various ethnic groups or religious groups. Uh, those uh, were neglected. And especially after 9-11, I think two major issues need to be uh, looked into. And that is uh, uh, the literacy in Afghanistan, women's issues, those are very important. And same is the case with regard to the new awareness with uh, regard to uh, different stakeholders uh, who think that uh, instead of presidential form of government, parliamentary form of government suits Afghanistan. These are quite uh, crucial uh, questions. Uh, may not have been raised perhaps uh, uh, before the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan or even during the civil war uh, after the withdrawal of the Soviet troops. But now these questions are being raised. So, and then that is being raised within the boundaries of Afghanistan. That has to be decided by Afghans themselves. No one else can do that. Um, as an observer, I can only see that the, when you look at Afghans president, uh, Afghanistan's present constitution, it looks like a cut and paste uh, uh, from the American constitution uh, in its very archaic form uh, that it has uh, a two tenure president and off he goes. But at the same time, this constitution is uh, uh, the Wolasi uh, Jirga uh, elections take place on non-party basis, while there are over 70 political parties in Afghanistan. So I want to understand that how the, this political engineering has been done and how this constitution was adopted. Uh, maybe Yasini Saab can enlighten us that how can uh, uh, elections could be held on non-party basis uh, uh, in the Wulasi Jirga and then uh, presidential form, uh, system is also, uh, uh, you know, the presidential voting also takes place on non-party basis. And then there are parties and there are groups, there are interest groups. So how it takes place? This is also a question and a, a, to our both Afghan eminent panelists, they, if they can answer us on that. And uh, definitely uh, we would be looking forward to, uh, to the responses. Thank you so much. Sir, uh, thank you so much. Um, now I would request once again, our uh, speakers from Afghanistan, uh, Sir Yasini and Dr. Uh, Yasa, if they could elaborate on the question. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much. It is very uh, important question. 
given to us by our very dear friends, uh, Ambassador Durrani. Uh, first of all, democracy without party is not moving anywhere. Pluralism is uh, with the party. There's no doubt about that. In theory, we must have political parties here. Uh, they have to introduce their candidates according to their parties and give tickets to them according to, the, to, to, to their parties, symbols and commitments. But we do not have, unfortunately, yet well-established political mainstream parties. There are different reasons for that. Uh, number one, the 40 years of the chaos uh, the, uh, met the right-wing parties uh, to the militancy. Uh, the 40 years of the war met the left-wing parties like Hulk and Percham uh, to also to the other form of the militancy. And uh, I would say that these are the, 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 the militant parties rather than political parties. If we see that how many uh, seats are occupied, even though if their candidates were not introduced by their parties to the floor or to the election commission, uh, that's not exceeding, the biggest party is not exceeding more than 10 seats. And when they go to the parliament, under the so-called name of their parties, there's a floor crossing and you don't have any floor crossing uh, law to be prevented there on the floor of the parliament. So we have, first of all, we have to uh, institutionalize the political uh, system in uh, the, the politics in Afghanistan, which is not yet. We copied the democracy. We forgot about democracies of 50 and 60s that were demolished uh, because of this revolution in up and down in chaos in the uh, interventions uh, of, of the foreign countries uh, and, and, and also by the, by, by, by the invasions uh, and internal fighting in chaos. See, we do not have yet established political system. We have to politicize the, the politics here, but I do mean we have to organize it. It is not organized yet. We do not have political parties there. There has to be political best there without political parties, even if it is parliamentary system, like in Pakistan, India, Kenya, or in the UK on the top of that or presidential on the top of uh, uh, that is the United States that does require strong political parties. We are lacking that. So hopefully one day, uh, sooner than later, uh, we, have to, we have to establish that. In keeping in mind, after the peace talks, that has to be the number one priority. How we can bring, do we access still uh, looking toward democracy and pluralism? I don't have any other system uh, in the world. I don't see that. So we have to stick to the pluralism in, 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 in political actions here in Afghanistan, and it does require the political parties. Indeed, this is a very valid point, and that has to be reformed, or that has to be fundamentalized or institutionalized in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to the question and answer session. Uh, we have been receiving a lot of questions from our audience members. Uh, unfortunately, we will not be able to incorporate all of those questions because of the brevity of time. Uh, but Mr. Vakar Ranja and quite a lot of other people have also been asking this. So if any of the speakers could answer this question, um, they want to know, is Afghan peace process likely to be continued after American election if Trump loses his electoral legitimacy? So if any of the speakers would like to answer this question. Uh, yes, Mr. Yassini, please. Well, yes, of course. This is not only uh, the Afghan issue is not the, 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 the uh, not only political issue. That's the, uh, the 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 American uh, establishment issue, and this issue has to be solved. We have to put an end to that. And as far as we are going to have to put an end to that. So uh, immaterial, if Biden wins or Trump wins, uh, they have to, 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 to stick with the formula. Uh, in the light of the international, uh, in the changing of international political uh, atmosphere, and also pressing issue is the COVID, particularly in the United States and around the world, they have to change 
the current political discourse and putting an end to this issue in the logical, the logical, the logical end to this case will be uh, the reconciliation with the Taliban to put a logical end to the current chaos. They are trapped there as well. Uh, they, have, they are confessing it. We know it. Uh, that this is not much differ. The American coming to Afghanistan is not much different with the Soviet invasion of 27 December 1979. So they have to put an end to that. For that, I do think that the, I, I mean, I'm sure they have to, 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 to carry on with the talks and uh, with the result oriented talks and they have to, to, to come up with the result. Thank you. I just want to add uh, one sentence to that. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, the inertia of this uh, agreement by the time the next president takes over or even the same president takes over uh, is such would have been uh, gone to such level that in my own mm. assessment this process Sometimes would be uh, irreversible uh, even if the uh, you know uh, American establishment prevails uh, they would not be able to reverse this process because the Afghans themselves, uh, they want this process to uh, succeed and they would have gone so far ahead as far as their uh, own uh, uh, talk, uh, intra afghan dialogue is concerned. I don't think it, it could be reversed. Uh, yes, Ms. Durrani, uh, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh... It is fallacious to tie uh, or to perceive the future of continuation of Afghanistan peace process only with the U.S. as a core actor. I think this is a mistake uh, that a number of uh, you know analysts continue to make. How to and by doing so, they're reducing the agency and the role of Afghanistan's neighbors and the rest of the international community, which is now heavily invested in the peace process. And here I respectfully disagree with Ambassador Asif Durrani, with from whom I learn a lot, by the way. As much as we wish and desire that the current peace process is led by the Afghans, the reality, sir, is quite to the contrary not least because of the hard economic uh, uh, you know, realities on the ground. One wishes that Af Afghans had that kind of autonomy and that kind of in economic and structural independence from international support and international financial assistance to be able to make those independent decisions for their future. But that is not the case. I think the dependency on the, in, on the role of the international community, the dependency on the role of Afghanistan's uh, neighbors, the dependency on whatever the policy uh, uh, Washington DC will maintain post elections, that creates a problem as well as an opportunity. The, pro the immediate problem from my view is that while the international community along with the US is currently invested in the Afghan peace process, there is, doesn't seem to be an international consensus of the key players, of the key powers on what that future ought to look like. To me, that is a big structural problem. Unless there is an inter unprecedented international consensus on how Afghanistan needs to be reconstructed these fault lines will continue to make the peace process vulnerable and fragile. I think it is imperative that in, in addition to the US or with the US, there has to be an international consensus. Um, it's not just about the US, it's not just about Pakistan or Iran. What is the larger international community thinking? How are the key players, whether that's Russia or China, the Middle Eastern country, have we achieved that international consensus? To my view, that is not the case. Yeah, I think uh, th there is this international regional consensus already present and we can see that. Uh, so maybe uh, we, we may differ with you on this very in instance. And also I think you're contradicting yourself 
by saying that it's fallacious to tie the Afghan peace to the American involvement. It's not fallacious. It's a, it's a, it's a reality. The, it was just one threat of withdrawing $1 billion from uh, the American assistance, which basically made uh, Ashraf Ghani uh, come around the corner and release almost all the prisoners. Uh, so I think we, uh, we have to understand that Zalmay Khalilzad invested a lot in bringing about that, at least the regional consensus on how to uh, move forward on the Afghan issue. And this is because of that international consensus that Ashraf Ghani and his, his friends, his colleagues eventually had to give in. So there is no, I think, uh, fallacy about it. It's a very bitter reality. We all have to understand and acknowledge. And it is this fallacy, it's this reality that will, I think, uh, eventually uh, help in launching the peace process. Once all the Taliban leaders Doha, at, at Doha, as well as the coming uh, uh, delegation from, the, from Kabul are out of quarantine. So I think they have to go through this uh, seven day quarantine requirement before they can uh, launch their dialogue probably next week. Uh, moving on to the next question, uh, we uh, have, the question is regarding ISIS, which is, uh, what are the interests of ISIS in Afghanistan and to what extent ISIS is able to damage the peace process? This question was asked by Etisham Rashid and is open to all panelists to answer. Yeah, Sirisa wants to say something, I think. I mean, ISIS is a proxy terror group serving various interests. So it has become very obvious, meanwhile. About the ISIS, well, ISIS is there for, for the total destruction. And it is endangering in, in, in the first degree the, the regional security. By the regional security, I do mean that uh, they are endangering the Gulf countries, they are endangering uh, Iraq, Libya, Syria is the classic case. They are endangering Afghanistan, and that is threat to uh, Pakistan security combined ISIS cells combined with uh, uh, TTP and that is uh, active in some areas in Afghanistan it is a very bitter reality and what is happening across the border on and off and not in South Wajiristan as well as in Baluchistan uh, most of those cases are originated by the ISIS with some regional players knowingly or unknowingly and some of the Taliban, unfortunately, some of the very, very fanatic Taliban, there is, a, there is a fear that in the case of the peace, that will also join the ISS cells, but <clears throat> ISS cell is still active, present. Last night, there were a couple of people apprehended in uh, Nangrahar uh, by the Afghan security forces. So that is a danger, the danger both to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and to the regional security, and that is just the destruction for the sake of the destruction without any manifesto or aims or, or, or motto. Uh, so that, that could be a dangerous uh, so-called movement for the present and for the near future. The whole countries, that's one of the reasons that we have to make Afghanistan peaceful. Sooner the better that the international and the regional terrorist groups cannot utilize from Afghanistan geography. And I'm alarming, first of all, myself and other brothers and friends in the region that they have to tackle and cure this disease. Uh, the sooner the better. Thank you. Uh, if we have no further questions, uh, so I would like to move to the next question that we have. Uh, basically, it has been asked by a lot of our participants, so I'll just sum it up uh, in one question. Uh, they want to know what will be the dynamics and the future of power sharing between Taliban and the political leadership of Afghanistan in the future governments if a peace negotiation is to be decided upon. So if any of the speakers would like to address this question. May I? Yes, sir, please. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, I would say that, of course, uh, <clears throat> peace is uh, certainly very important issue on, and this is uh, uh, the 
this, this is the desire of all of us, all Afghans across the country. Uh, everybody is fed up of war and uh, the disaster. Uh, but anyway, uh, nobody spoke on that uh, issue. The overall peace process seems to be a little bit, uh, in my view, a little bit mechanic, mechanical rather than the, uh, a genuine one. Uh, because it seems that many players are uh, very tactfully playing the game, uh, choosing their, of their words, uh, uh, praises, uh, and uh, uh, I'm thankful to Barakov Foundation teaching both sides that how to speak with each other, with what tone. But anyway, at the end of the day, everything has to come on the table and they have to discuss the issue, not in the vague term, like uh, the issue of women. And now it is a very old thing that everyone, okay, Islam, Sharia, they are allowing equal partnership for the women, but when they will come to the table, so again, I would go that they have, uh, they have to, to show that what is their procedural approach. So what type of uh, particip participation of women they want. And they said that, okay, we are, uh, we are in favor of the, and uh, favor of uh, an inclusive government. We, Islam believes in equality and uh, there is Musawat Muhammadi and so on. But at the end of the day, you have to decide with those participants that what is your and what is mine on, and on which principles. So uh, that's why it seems a little bit complex but anyway, I don't know, either uh, Berghoff uh, Foundation has uh, taught them all these angles or not. Uh, it will come very soon. And I believe that there is no any pro proper mechanism how to distribute power. If Ghani Saab thinks that they will offer Mullah Ibatullah the post of uh, 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 Chief Justice or Ministry of Pilgrimage or Religious Affairs, uh, or the other uh, departments dealing with the religious issues. I think this is, uh, uh, his, if he's thinking on this line, I don't think that it is correct. And on the other issue that if he thinks that he will, he will lead the process as per his wishes, then he will be sitting on the driving seat and the Taliban will go and sit on the back seat. This also seems to be very impossible. So this is this question remains to be the most difficult question of the day and of course of this process. So that's why how will you how the question is how will you uh, bring all this uh, uh, all these differences different you see lifestyle different type of approach. I personally I love Taliban. They are the part of Afghanistan. They are uh, an important and undeniable part of Afghanistan, no doubt. But they don't have the right to impose their lifestyle on me, on my wife, on my children. So that's why this is the question. We need an accommodative system. If you believe in such, such values, you are welcome. You should practice as per your faith and whatever system you like. But let the other people to live as per their faith, as per their culture, as per their values. So that's why. It is premature question. What I am, uh, God forbid, Hakam Badahan, God forbid. What I am uh, uh, looking uh, at the, at the uh, upcoming scenario. This is this is not a very uh, bright outlook. I don't see that, and I I am sure that the Taliban. It is not yet started, but it's just announced, and all sides are em emphasizing on the peace. Uh, ceasefire, but uh, you see in Ghazni province, in the northern provinces, there are intense fighting is going on. There should be, uh, they should show some, some gestures that yes, they are, they believe wholeheartedly in peace. So that's why this question is very difficult. And I don't think that what Ashraf Ghani Sahib is thinking on that line, it is, it will be materialized. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yasa. Uh, now I have one final question. Uh, and this question is from Mr. Khalid Hussain Chandiyu, who is also the research fellow at uh, IPRI. 
and the question is fairly simple uh, and it's posed to the afghan speakers and pakistani speakers as well uh, the question is what in your view can be a potential spoiler in the afghan peace process and what do you think is actually a current uh, spoiler that needs to be dealt with uh, in, or, in in this whole afghan peace process so if any of the speakers would like to address this question yes mr yasini please Sir, you have muted yourself, sir. If you could kindly unmute yourself. That's perfect. Please. Okay. Now, first of all, I want to just go uh, a step behind. Uh, what type of the government, what will be mood of the operande in the next future is just go, I'm, I'm referring for the sake of the reference to the two annexes, uh, which is to the agreement uh, between the United States and the Taliban in Doha. Nobody knows about it yet. I don't know if our leadership here in Kabul knows that. Uh, but there has to be some sort of uh, agreement on the next government. It's a big question to me. This is a big question uh, to our brother, Dr. Yasa, to all Afghans. We are worried about our future. Uh, we have to, to, to uh, we cannot go back to 2002, uh, uh, 2001, 2000, 2000, uh, and something like that. Uh, all, the, all the progress has to be achieved and preserved in Afghanistan. And uh, nobody can in, in, impose, except from a tyrannic government, uh, their will on the people of Afghanistan. They, they have to be independent. They have to think and they have to find out uh, the, their own ways of life for them. And that is, that is not the only dictated lives uh, uh, way of um, living or, 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 or mood of living for, for, for them. Uh, just. If you do not do that, and if you try to impose a certain type of dictatorial uh, on the Afghans, that will lead to another calamities in Afghanistan and, and without its boundary. So just leave Afghanistan for the Afghan that how they would like to, to, uh, to, to live uh, in Afghanistan. That, that, that was that. the second thing, the spoiler. All those who can benefit from the chaos in Afghanistan is the spoilers. All those hands who are infringing the security of the Afghan and its neighbor, those are the spoilers. The United States has to be aware of that. We have to be aware of that. The Afghan government has to be aware of that. And the Taliban has to be aware of, aware of that. And that is the most dangerous segment of the, the story because they would like indefinitely to see a chaos that to make the water dirty and then they can catch their fishes in it. So this is a very, very important issue in the international community and all those who are leading the process and particularly the process of the peace has to be vigilant about those players. They can play the negative role here. Thank you. If I am allowed to add, uh, I think Yasini Sahib covered it. Uh, uh, he, he laid down the principle very well that all those who benefit from the chaos will be the spoilers. And I can list some of them uh, if I am allowed. Um, for, forgive me for because I am a general and a retired general and not a diplomat. So at times I don't know how to be diplomatic. Uh, ISIL, Tariq Taliban, Pakistan. Uh, narcotic barons, gun runners, and uh, and many others. And uh, I would just give one apprehension, and uh, uh, you can interpret it yourself. Whereas Americans are interested in their own peaceful exit, whether they are interested in peaceful Afghanistan or not, I would not comment. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that brings an end to the question and answer session. I request our acting president, Brigadier Rashid Wali Janjua, for his concluding remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, thank all the distinguished panelists and discussants for a very uh, uh, you know, engaging discussion. And we stand uh, educated after this discourse. And I'm especially thankful to my uh, 
Afghan brothers who have uh, very candidly expressed their views and uh, made us wiser on issues uh, that uh, many of us are not clear here. And uh, some of the very important takeaways that we take is obviously starting with, with all those uh, who will benefit from the chaos uh, would be the spoilers here and the need to identify those spoilers. Then uh, we uh, learned that there's a need for a new constitutional arrangement and that constitutional arrangement should be based on the principles of republicanism and pluralism. And a new approach is required, whether it is presidential or parliamentary, it is up to the Afghans to decide, but definitely the need for a new beginning and a new break from the old uh, constitution. Whether it is an amendment or a change, it is for Afghans to decide, uh, but it's an important takeaway. Then the CPAC's linkage. This has come about as a very important takeaway that the BRI and the southern part of that is especially beneficial to Afghanistan and all Afghan factions, irrespective of their mutual differences, they agree on the need for economic interdependence. Then there was also a consensus on the need to control the security threats like ISIS, which uh, transcend Afghanistan and uh, which are a threat to the regional security as well. Uh, an aspect regarding the Afghan politics and the need to uh, you know, uh, have uh, parties with a lot of maturity was also highlighted. And uh, I'm sure uh, given a, a you know, long, uh, the peace interregnum after this uh, long conflict, that process of democratic uh, reconstruction would also begin along with the reconstruction of Afghanistan. The need for international communities, sincerity and commitment, as pointed out in the end by General Lodi, that the commitment and sincerity of United States being the strongest proponent of this peace process and uh, the largest stakeholder is also crucial. And the role of international uh, institutions uh, is also crucial from the rebuilding and reconstruction and repatriation of uh, the Afghan uh, refugees, because unless there is a commitment on the uh, part of international community for a long-term and uh, sustained basis, uh, this piece would be fraught with risks of uh, a recidivism back to the violence and conflict. And for that, international community and even the regional countries have a large role to play. So with the, uh, this, uh, I conclude the seminar and I once again thank the participants and discussants for a very engaging discussion. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your participation, especially our speakers and our active participants. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.